You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we have a really, really special guest. We have Pat O'Donnell. The flathead controversy, or let's say just call it a firestorm because it's so tribal. I didn't understand this. It's kind of like, it's almost like Boston sports where you have these tribes and people will fight to the hilt for their tribe. And whether you're for flatheads or against flatheads, I want to make sure on this show, we get everybody's opinion. We've heard from the bass guys and what their thoughts are. We had the Maryland DNR on the show and told us their thoughts. And now I wanted somebody who's passionate about catching these fish in the upper Potomac river. Pat, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you uh, having me on. Uh, just for any listeners, I, I just want to make it clear I'm not a guide or anything like that. It's just something that I like to do. You know, it's a passion of mine. <laughs> yeah, pl- please do not send him hate mail or start sticking out. <laughs> house, okay, I really don't want that to be part part of my conscience. Um, what Pat like really like we were talking before the show started. Yep. What got you into this? I, again, I just wanted some. You know, I live in the Frederick area. I just wanted some pullage. Really, I just wanted something to to pull drag. I went to college on the Eastern Shore. Salisbury University and University of Mount Eastern Shore and like, you know, shark fish, land-based shark fishing from the shore. And, you know, that pulls drag and you can get that same thing with, with flatheads and catfish around here. What's the biggest so, shark you've caught? I'm sorry. What's the biggest shark you've caught? Uh, I'd say a five foot spinner shark. That was actually this oh, summer. Yeah, where'd where'd you get that out of? Uh, Cape May, New Jersey. Oh my God. That's freaking awesome. Hey, they're there. You can cast out and I've seen people catch a lot bigger sharks than that from shore just casting out have you ever seen somebody catch like a bull shark or something like that no uh, i did see on some of the facebook groups and stuff down at acid they actually caught a tiger shark holy crap <laughs> they're, with the tiger and everything they're they're coming up so that they're they're there dude okay i can see why you'd want to get into catfishing if you're yeah. used to like pulling out a, a freaking like six foot creature like that that's insane yeah yeah now, how, how did you like get like, so you moved to this area and did you just see it on Facebook? Like the catfish thing? Did you go out? Like, how did you get into the cult? So well, ever since, I guess, just, just reading message boards and Facebook. So like websites like catfishone.com, there used to be a message board called the catfish nation. And that was uh, about maybe 10, 15 years ago when I was in high school, like as a kid, just reading the message boards and seeing them talk about it as well. And I believe in what I heard, that's how they got into this area of the Potomac River. Mm. So I've heard, you know, they were seeing it on the message boards. And I've also talked to an old timer at Lander Boat Ramp one morning. And he was saying that these guys in Walkersville, that's where the Catfish Nation, I guess, owner was at the time. I, I don't want to say any names or anything. No, no, no. They were taking uh, the flatheads out of the Susquehanna, putting them in their trucks and driving them to the Potomac out here and putting them in the river in the upper Potomac. Mm, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So <clears throat> with, with that said, did, is this the first time these past two years that you actually went catfishing in general or just targeting flathead? Uh, I'd say uh, I've catfished before. A lot of times I do it, I guess in the title, we're actually right around DC. You know, they have the blue catfish and those get huge. Me and my buddies actually went out a couple of weeks ago and we, we pulled like a 22 pounder. That's no slouch. So, but they, blue cats get huge and they're really big in the lower Potomac. Have they always been there too? Uh, they're invasive as well. Mm. But I feel like kind of like the flatheads again, they just kind of take over and, and they're here to stay. Really, I feel like. Are you looking for a really cool marketing opportunity to help grow your business? What would you think if your business logo ended up on every YouTube video we create? Plus you get a commercial slot for every single podcast. If you're interested in helping support our channel, please reach out to me at fishingthedmv at gmail.com. The email address again is fishingthedmv at gmail.com. I, they're definitely here to stay. I mean, for better yeah. or worse, whatever people's opinions are online with this thing, it's like they're here to stay. There's nothing you can do about them. And now we're just trying to find like coexistence. But like like you said, like there are people that really like to catch them and, and really talk about that. What is it about the flathead that is so alluring to anglers? I would just say one, I, I really think they're hard to catch. Like once you really? think you have them figured out, like you get skunked a couple weekends in a row. Like, I guess I'll just go a little over about starting off in the springtime. Cause once the water temperature gets about 50 degrees, that's when they start to get active and they put the feed bag on. So in this area, 
April, early May. That's when I think is the best time to catch them. You got two camps where they think that the spring and then also in the fall before the winter. So one, the pre-spawn bite is my favorite and I can go out. I think I haven't figured it out. I'll catch four or five a night. That's a good night for me. And, uh, once the spawn hits a lot of cat fishermen say from, uh, Memorial day, the 4th of July, that's when they're spawning. Like you can catch them, but it's, it's difficult. You're not going to catch as many numbers because not every single flathead is going to spawn at the same time, but doing it then that's, that's tough. You, you might not, you might get skunked or you'll get maybe one. And then I'm excited this year. This I'm a high school teacher and football. I was a football coach. It's my first year not coaching. Oh, cool. I get, I get to fish the, uh, the fall bite. So I'm excited about that because you have some flathead fishermen that prefer actually fishing in the fall before over the spring. So I'm excited to try that out too. Well, I'm going to have to ask now, like football coaching, that's freaking awesome. How long did you do that for? Uh, wow. Uh, six, six years. It's wow. Six years in high school. I've coached in college and, and stuff like that too. Really? What, what college did you coach at? Salisbury. Salisbury oh, that's and, freaking awesome, dude. Yeah. yeah. What side of the ball did you coach on? I'm an offensive guy. Okay. Yeah. And that's why you like catfish too. Cause it's just power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now th- does the, the flathead and the channel cat, cause the channel cat is a native species to the river. Yeah. Do you, do you target them the same way or do you have to, do you have to separate your strategies? I I would say I would target it the same way. I think one of the most major, just, I would say there's maybe two things, two or three things that are super important with targeting the flatheads is one. I feel like you have to have good bait. Right. Flat has the apex predator. They want what's in the water. They don't want chicken livers. They don't want, I mean, technically, I mean, you guess you could catch them on chicken or chicken livers or some type of dough bait, but primarily they want what's in the water. So having good bait is the, is one of my major, I'd say major tip to have good bait. So a lot of flathead fishermen joke around before you go, you got to do your chores, AKA you got to catch the bait. So I'll catch maybe a dozen, uh, Maryland law, I, you can't have more than 15. Um, I think you saw, I had the bait tank right here, Blue uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but there's nothing in there right now, but, mm-hmm. um, you gotta have this right wrong way. It's right there. Yep, but, I see uh, <laughs> you gotta have the, uh, you gotta have good bait. Um, and the way I'm targeting them is I'm just using a simple, you know, Carolina rig, uh, that, uh, maybe two ounces, three ounces on the bottom. Um, and then, I also, I like to like offer them, like if I'm fishing two or three rods, I want to offer them, see what they like. And then based on what they take, I'll make adjustments for. So I might throw out a bluegill on one rod, a creek chub on the other, and then cut bait on the third, if I'm fishing with three. Hmm. And then based on what I get to hit, if they hit the bluegill, I'm making sure all three of my next casts are all live bluegill. Interesting. um, One thing that I think is a tip, um, what they call it a Sandy Cooper rig. So it's basically a Carolina rig, but all it is is just a little float attached. So when that baits on the bottom, instead of having the bluegill to get free range, it's going to fight against the float and keep it up. Maybe a foot or so in the water column. So it can't get into structure. can't get into Interesting. Strength. That's cool. So that's one thing that I like. And I think I probably catch most of them on this. Um, and one thing that I, that I do, I use a circle hook, um, six to eight dot, I uh, maybe it might be overkill, but you never know when that 30 pounder is going to be around, um, is I snell mm. and it creates like a trigger effect. And I definitely have a better hookup ratio when I snell my using snelled hooks. Once I made that adjustment, what size circle hook do you usually use? This is an eight. So anywhere from six to eight, I know it's probably kind of overkill. But, you know, like I said, <laughs> you never know when that 30, 40 pounder is going to be there. And this thing's got some monster mouths. But like, well, so then perfect world, what size blue go? Because I'm thinking with a hook that big, that's poor sucker's not going to be able to swim if he's too I, small. Oh, I'm using maybe uh, probably something the size of my palm. Bigger? Okay. okay. The, close to my palm, maybe. About five inches or ish. Yeah. I mean, if you get smaller, you still, I mean, you cannot, uh, if you get, you can't really, uh, control the size of your bait sometimes. So and I just, I'm just going, I'm wading a Creek near the house, the Tuscarora Creek or the Catoctin Creek. And I'm just throwing a split shot with a little, 
long shank hook just to see what I can catch bluegill creek chubs. Mm, gotcha. 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 So with that rig, I think that's so cool. Cause I think I saw, um, on TikTok this guy called chunky who actually fishes, he does live streams at DC. Yep. He yep. Tons of those rods. How many rods when you catfish do you usually like, like what well, is the perfect number of rods to have out at one time? I guess. Well, at Maryland law, I think you can only have, again, no quote, you can yeah, have yeah. Two, two or three. So okay. I'm, and honestly, if I'm by myself, I don't want to fish more than three because that's a lot of work. Because you want to, I frequently, in the perfect world, you have a lot of bait. You you want to keep the bait as fresh as possible. So you're doing bait changes every 45 minutes, mm. right? I mean, if you have more, you could do it more frequently. But if you're fishing four, five, six rods, and you're on the bank, which is I'm primarily on the bank. It's a ton of work. It's a lot of work because you got to lug it down to the bank. I mean, there's a couple spots on the river where you can just back your truck up to it and fish out of the fish out of your car but those spots are like always taken yeah i was gonna say like that's the next thing is if you're fishing from the bank i mean and, and the river i mean you know we could we could bring it actually bring this thing up on the, on the yep. screen here mm -hmm. um like this river is freaking massive and yes. how if you're a bank fisherman i mean don't give away your juice but just in general mm -hmm. Is it hard for you to find key areas? Is it just where you know, or is there a lot of access points on the river? Uh, there, I mean, you could, it's, it's nice now with technology, like on Google maps, you can go on the CNO canal now and literally tap it. And they like, you know how on like, uh, like Google maps, you can click and it'll give you a street view. Mm -hmm. It'll give you a CNO canal view. So like rather really? than, yes. Yeah, so like I do that, I've done that, but I've also, you know, I've went, teacher i have summers off depending on if i work or not one morning no one's there i could take the time to go up and scout different spots i mean you um that's probably my favorite spot that you have up there at williamsport oh, that's, that's where i got my my pb so really yep we're, we're gonna get to that in a minute yeah, um it's good but Okay. CNO canal. I like that idea. Cause it does give you a lot of like room to go at least on the, on the Maryland side, but Holy crap, that is a long way to hike to pump a bucket and like a couple of rods. Like, are you using a bike when you do that? No, or? I'm, I'm just carrying it. I got, got a little system. Oh, I got my backpack with all my tackle in it. I got a cooler that I slug over my shoulder. I carry three rods in my left hand and the bait bucket in my right. I don't bring a chair. Um, I either stand or I, I find like a log or something to sit on. You must be jacked. Good God. I don't know about all that work. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot of work. What, what, um, what are the sizes you're seeing? Cause you know, as you can see from all the, all the social media threads are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, they're saying that the flathead are taking over the river. We had mm -hmm. Maryland DNR saying like they, they are growing. There's a lot of yes. this, but you were, sorry, go, I mean, no, no, go, no, go for it. So I think I messaged this a little bit before, um, and you've talked about this before. I mentioned this on your podcast. Up between Dam Four and Dam Five, I believe that's where they were originally put. That's definitely where the bigger ones are. Like when I go up to Williamsport, um, Dam anywhere between Dam Four and Dam Five, they got tons of spots, and I've seen people catch theirs. My, my biggest is twenty five thirty. I've seen on Facebook groups um, the biggest cat. There's a there's a tournament that they do like a catfish tournament. I, again, they're, they, they know more about it than me. They have the boats, the big rod racks on their back. They're putting the time on the water. The biggest that I've seen so far this year in the upper Potomac was Williamsport night. Um, and they was 35. Holy God. Yes. So when I go up there, I definitely have a chance in my opinion to get a bigger catfish. My PB is 2530. Um, my biggest, in Montgomery County, so anywhere from uh, White's Ferry, Edwards Ferry, up to, I would say, um, like Harper's Ferry, the biggest that I've caught this year is 16. And I will say, <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's And that was on a big bluegill, my biggest one that I had that night, and it just took off. Um, now I have caught in, I got, maybe at the farther north you go, the bigger they get. Maybe that's one way to put it. So, and they have the two, I've, again, I've only been doing it for two years. The, this year, it might, they've definitely bigger than they were two years ago when I first started. 
like what sizes do you think you'll see in five, six, seven years? Like, I, I don't, do you, do you have any idea on like the records and stuff of flatheads in the area, like the Susquehanna so, area? Yeah. So as of last year, again, that might've changed it. The biggest flathead Maryland state record on the Susquehanna was 53 pounds, I believe. Good Lord. So they get big and they don't have any predators and I, they can spawn up to like 12,000 uh, fry in one spawn. So Ow. I don't, I, I, I just Googled that on a, before I got on the podcast, but they could, there, there's like thousands of fish in their fry. So well, that's, what, that's what we do here is we just yep. kind of went and, good God. Yeah. There it is. Susquehanna. Mm-hmm. That thing is freaking, holy shit. Yep. I got PA, but yeah, they're, they're, I mean, it's still like, that is, yeah. that's a big, big fish. Like, and how many flathead, like, are they going to stack in there like carp will, or, or are they a very solitary creature? Um, will you have flathead that big paired up or are they more of like a, you're targeting a one fish, like a muskie? Uh, I, they're solitary, I would say. But again, if someone proves you wrong, I'm mm-hmm. willing to, you know, they're right if they prove me wrong, but they're solitary. They're the apex predator and they primarily feed at night. That's not saying you can't catch them during the day. So my first thing, my first major key was um, good bait. Number two, time on the water. Okay. My PB flathead was caught in less than three feet of water. You're kidding. Yeah. N- no, I'm not. Dude, like, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, oh, I've a whole nother ball game. I just, this, this year I just got a kayak. So I've been trying to catch them from the kayak have not been successful yet, but at night that's when I, they're the apex predator and they'll travel. They'll, uh-huh. they'll come up and they, wherever the bait is, they're going to follow it. So they'll come up in less than three feet of water to feed at night. And that's where I caught, um, my PB. I need to hear that story. I'm sorry. Can, can we hear the story of how you caught your PB three feet of water? There's gotta be a story there with it. It's actually kind of funny. I was, I was with, with, with my brother. Um, we actually wanted to fish a different spot that night. We wanted to fish where the Antietam Creek dumps into the Potomac. And there, we got there, it was super low. There was already fishermen there. There was actually someone waiting in the middle of the creek and he caught a walleye, which was pretty cool. Um, so we were like, screw it. Let's, let's go to Williamsport. We go to Williamsport. We fished for like two hours, nothing. And it was, act- we were fishing three rods that night and it was actually on a bait change. I think I got the left rod. My brother got the right rod. We were reeling in the baits, checking them, seeing if they were lively to cast them back out and the middle rod went off. Oh, so wow. it was pretty cool. So if we, if we took the middle rod instead, we, w- we wouldn't have caught that fish. That's insane. And you said yeah. it was in three feet of water where that one yep. was. Yep. So I took the kayak out at Williamsport with the depth finder and it was probably higher when I read that it was like three feet than the time I went last year. And I, I caught that fish in July wow. of 2021. And that's a pressured area. I mean, I know I fished, um, I think you saw my hidden gems I did in the canal system there. Like that place gets the snot pounded out of it too from bank pressure and everything else. It's it's right. I mean, you. I'm not going to try and pronounce the creek. I know it's in the jig. That, like a jig. Yeah. It's that right where that meets. You got to get there early to get the spot. Hmm. Now, do you think that's like the stretch where the bigger ones are going to come from between Dam 4, Dam 5 in the future? I, yeah, I, I think, I mean, that... 25, 30 pound fish can't like nothing. There, there's no predators for it. So all it's going to do is feed. Have you ever tried flathead fishing down near actually, you know, let me just pull it up on the old Google Earth. It makes it easier. Okay. Cause I, I was like looking at this uh, the other day when I did my, um, we just had Jeff green on again. We have him on monthly to do his fishing report. I've watched that. Yep. And he talked about if you go down towards, let me, let me pull it up here, past Antietam Creek and yep. you go all the way. Where is Ashburn? Here we go. Uh, where is she right here? Yeah, here she is. So if you go down here where this, where the Seneca Creek comes in, he says where damn two used to be here. Yep. I've, I've tried that spot before. Once. Yeah. Like, do you Sorry. ever think like, Oh no, you're fine. I was like, do you ever think that the farther South you go, like the flathead population will, will start pushing down and you'll start to see bigger ones down there too. I, I believe so. I mean, if originally inv- people stocking them in the upper Potomac between Dam four and Dam five, and now I'm catching them lander. Uh, I haven't caught them at Nolan's Ferry, but lander, mouth of Monocacy, the aqueduct. Um, 
I'm catching them down here. They're and I'm seeing them catch them. I've seen on Facebook groups them catch them south in that area as well. So um, yeah, I, I do believe so. And I eventually, I think they'll catch up. I mean, there's nothing in that river. My PB, not PB, but I guess PB for this for the river in Frederick Montgomery County area is 16. There's no that fish doesn't have any predators, mm -hmm. so it's only going to grow, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it's just it's crazy to think about that we're going to have something there that's I think 30 pounders are going to be easy, especially yeah. in the next couple of years. While we yeah, had exactly. Odin, we had Odin Kirk on okay. um, over the summertime, he talked about the snakehead, how there's a bell curve where mm -hmm. you'll see this population really shoot up and then it'll it'll, it'll kind of find balance. And so right. I, I'd have to assume between now and the next 10 years is when you're going to have the biggest flathead in this river. Yep. Because the bluegill, especially, they just, they're so stupid. A lot of them don't understand this thing as a predator, which I think is what happened when the snakehead got into a lot of places. Like these bluegill are like, who the hell is this guy? Right. And they just didn't have that built in fear of them yet. Yeah. But I mean, uh, flathead will eat bass too. And I guess that's where a lot of the flat from the smallmouth camp. Well, since um, you brought it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's segue into that. <laughs> what are you seeing with that? All right, all right now. Okay. Let me, let's put something yeah. to rest here. So this is on the, on the, um, on the old threads too. Yeah. Are, are, are flathead guys using smallmouth as bait? No, absolutely not. I only use what's legal. I'm only using uh bluegill and Creek chub. There you go, guys. So, so I'm, yeah. I'm not, I've also, um, my, uh, my shock leader is less pound test than this leader so if i get snagged up my whole reel my whole whole line is not going into the river i think we so i just wanted to make that clear as well and i also when i go i'm wearing either rain boot rain boot like boots up to my knees or waders so like honestly where i was fishing last weekend i got snagged up i'm the water's so low i've walked out into the river and able and I'm able to get the snag out I, yeah, I think honestly, with the people I've hung out with and, and the people I've talked to, I think that is where the catfishermen have gotten this bad reputation is when they are using like 600 pound braid yep. and, and they, and they cut off. And I, I had a picture, um, I'll, I'll try to post on my Instagram where there was an owl caught up in a bunch of, of line on the side of the mm -hmm. river. And he actually yeah. went there and cut it free and stuff. And it, I'm not saying it's the catfish angler, but there is this rap that it's the catfish anglers that are leaving all this braided line out and, and litter. Yeah, and <laughs> I think if that was just gone out of the equation, right. it would be completely different. Um, but then again, like, yeah, there's just such a weird fight between flathead guys and cat and bass guys. And like you said, like, there is some evidence that flatheads do eat smallmouth because they, they are the top dogs. So in other states, I, it is legal. And I've uh, a cup. I learned a lot um, from this. He's a YouTuber. His name Spencer River Certified is his name on Instagram. Um, I think he, I believe he caught one of his biggest flatheads on like a large mouth. I could believe it. I think Alabama, mm -hmm. they're legal too, that you can use yeah. there. There's a lot of States. Yeah. So, um, River certified. Yeah. He's, he, I've learned a lot from him river certified. Uh, but, uh, that again, I'm not saying this, but a lot of people in the flathead camp says our, your five pound PB would, could be our bait for our 50 pounder. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, <laughs> I'm just joking. But <laughs> I know like I, I I've seen people and again, like guys, before you start getting all crazy, because the same thing when you see a person like keeping a bass and eating it, it's like, guys, if it's in the slot limit, if it's a legal it's fish good. that he can keep, I mean, like we do, I understand the catch and release culture, which has been huge for the, for any sports fish, by the way, guys, not yeah. just this. And spoiler, I've talked about this a ton on my channel where I do see in 10 years where the DNR is going to protect snakeheads. Because that's becoming such a cult following. And if you just have no slot limits or anything with that, those will be gone. And then you're going to lose revenue. Because there's a lot of people that are snakehead fishing now that probably wouldn't fish unless there was snakeheads. Snakehead. So, right. And so, I don't know. I, I can see them protecting that. So, my, my whole point is here, if it's if it's a legal keep, that's fine. I, mm -hmm. I, think, I think what freaks people out is the thought of like, are you taking... 200 pounds of bluegill out of a river that the flathead are eating are people like, you know, cutting up five pounds smallmouth, but, but I don't think that's necessarily happening. Right. Some people are also, uh, like I, I think, uh, there's two stores. There's a store in Williamsport that sells it. And then there's a store in Downsville that sell them. It's called black salties. They're <laughs> like, it's a bait. You know, you can get them in different sizes. Um, I actually know a guy, he's a flathead fisherman. He uh, 
he has property on a creek and uh he gets them delivered to their house and keeps them in the creek in like a cage hmm. and that's supposedly like flathead candy too so like salties yep. yeah google these things. anderson yeah. farms i believe is the uh the huh. name so if you type in black salt these anderson farms now i've tried them before but i had way more success on what's in the river the um oh, blue yellow, so. okay. mm -hmm. supposedly <laughs> those are really lively and hardly and i if you ever get it get your hands on those i really recommend using the sandy cooper rig with the float because they will find structure and not stay in the water column. How big do they get? Uh, I th I believe you can buy them up to maybe, and don't quote me on this, probably five inches, four to five inches. Now, are these like, are you legally allowed to have these in Maryland or is this more of like a hush-hush thing? That I don't know. It, I mean, some people, I don't, but some people buy goldfish from a pet store and use that as bait too. Yeah, and everyone no, at home, just, just yeah, just be careful about that. that. So I don't do that at all. I don't get the cops called on me for suggesting people, you know, right? <laughs> do things that are. I've already had people get uh, yelling at me that I'm trying to like get uh, uh, gobies put in like the Shenandoah. It's like, no, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that. I'm I'm just right. saying like, how do we help out the fishery? Because that brings a good point here. It's like if, and this is something I keep bringing up. If we could, would stocking blue kill in the river help the fishery? Would that help balance things out? I mean, I think that's a good point. It definitely might. You would have your predators like the smallmouth bass, anything that we need, a bluegill, flathead, channel catfish, smallmouth, would there'd be more food. So I guess maybe in theory, they would get bigger. Because like the two things when I go to Williamsport and I kayak there and I do my fishing is some years there's not a lot of vegetation and you okay. don't see a ton of bait. Like it is, mm -hmm. and that's why, again, it just seems like people go to like the canal with buckets mm -hmm. and two plus two equals four now, is that what they're doing? Is they're catching bluegill bait? And is that is that because it's easier to catch it in the canal or is that because like the river needs to be restocked with bluegill? Yeah, that that I'm not sure. I, in my, I think it's easier. Again, I'm not, I don't do it on the canal, but it's easier for me to, to wade the Catoctin Creek, Tuscarora Creek. I know people who fish ponds too as well, get their dozen bluegill that way than it is to catch bluegill from the river. Mm. I don't know if that's because again, like you said, there's not as many bluegill or if it's just easier to me, it's easier to catch it before going to the river. What other, like, have you ever tried to use eels before? I know like that's a hot bait for uh, blue cats. Blue cats. That's what I was going to say. And where I live, it's, it's hard to get them. You're going to have to go to like anglers in Annapolis or, or something like that. If you want live eel, or you could try, I don't, I don't know if there's any fish markets nearby, but uh, I've used eel actually, and this is the first, I'm going on a tangent right now. No, go for it. That's what this is all, all about. <laughs> I've, the, it's funny. So shark, catfish, shark want what's in the water. They want fresh cut. Like if you catch spot, croaker, kingfish, whiting, you catch that, cut it up. That's, that's what they want. If you can buy something from a bait shop, like bunker or something, that's good too, if it's fresh, but I was in Cape May, the guys at Jim's Tackle Shop. Um, they were telling me that, hey, they're biting on live eel. I've never used eel. I know people, like you said, eel for blue cats and I guess for striper as well in the bay. Um, that's what I caught that five foot spinner shark. On an eel. On, on an eel. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So I, that opened me up because I'm I'm always was always in the camp. No, you want what's in the they want what's in the water and you know it's fresh and everything like that. Is shark fishing pretty much catfishing on steroids? Yes. Yes. I'm for shark fishing. I'm using a an eight thousand eight thousand size reel. Um, people who are real serious about it, who kayak it out and go after huge ones, making two four hundred yard drops. You know, they're using something you might use for like a tuna or something like that. Yeah, that's I, I've seen those videos, and it's just it's insane like what not only what you can catch from a beach but what you can catch from a kayak because the idea of getting towed by something that freaking big is insane yeah. but i remember when, when we go down to um to the florida keys and we would shark fish and stuff about using current and chum slicks and things like mm -hmm. that and it honestly is it is like catfishing about how yeah. you got to position the bait and let their nose find it but what's interesting to me and, and you know you've done this way more than than i have do you use live bait consistently for sharks um or is it usually just dead things 
it to me it's usually just dead. I normally if I like if I it's if I catch something, I'm gonna cut that up. And that gives me like if I get a nice size croaker or spot, I'm getting two I'm able to fish two fresh pieces on the rod. Whereas if I use it live, I'm only using it one and you got the chance of it coming off the hook. Mm, that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, I've I've heard of people when I was at Cape May, maybe like ten years ago, I've they, oh, this guy just caught a five, six foot bull shark on a live, uh, I forgot what it was. I think it was a live croaker, but so but you could use both. What size leader are you using? Generally speaking? Cause I know like you have to use like several different leaders, right? Because the shark skin guys, if you don't, if you live in a rock, you've never watched shark week before the skin of the shark can actually cut the line. So, so it's that, a system. If you give me a second, I'll yep. grab one of my rigs. Go for it. All right. Yeah, I know you guys are like Tom, but this was a catfish special. Like, yeah, but I, I have I'm ADHD. I, I have ADHD. No, no, you're fine. I'm the one with ADHD. I just, I just love getting on tangents because that's where this is, yeah. this is so much fun. Let me find my pliers, and I actually have it on this rod behind me. I'll cut it off. All right. okay. And guys, I don't even know if you can see this right now, but look at the size of this thing right here. I'm gonna pull this up right here. Look at the size of this freaking catfish. This thing's insane. Good God. I think it'd swallow a small shark. So God damn, I got, like I'm using basically when I um when I'm shark fishing. I this is on a tangent because I know this is a catfish special. I don't know. Go for it. Go for it. I love the uh, tangents. Yeah. Are awesome. So I'm using a ten knot circle hook. Okay, I have it crimped. Okay, I have an offshore mm -hmm. loop here, and I'm only using like a foot of cable leader, forty nine strand. Now off that, I'm using heavy mono, okay? Again, this is crimped as well with an offshore loop. And this is for, and this has happened before, like you said, their, their skin's like sandpaper. They, they can easily rub you off. I've gotten, I think I've gotten broken off a couple of times. Actually, this one of the spinner sharks, and I was using 80 pound mono, this, it, you know, spinner sharks, they jump and spin. It's actually, it's awesome to see. You know, it, it literally rubbed, rubbed me off and, and rubbed through 80 pound mono. So I know a lot of people go heavier, but I have a section like this. So I guess that's maybe six feet because I'm, I'm casting. Mm. And then on between the swivel, that's where I have my sinker slider. So I'm literally laying it on the ground and then casting from there. So you're basically, I mean, you said casting, but are you casting or are you kayaking this sucker out? I'm casting now. When I go down to the outer banks or something like that, I'm gonna I kayak it out. <laughs> why? Why there? Just, just because, or is there a good reason? I'm not. I, I'm not an expert enough on that. But I did it one summer, and I had a lot of success with okay. the kayak because I guess it's honestly it wasn't as rough as it was in at Assateague or Cape May when I'm there. So I felt a little more comfortable to kayak it out. <laughs> I, I just like, cause like you can get so much distance too, when you kayak it out. But now, now are you using the same, like basically this same setup? What I mean by like the rod and reel, are they using it for sharks and catfish? Are these specifically rod and reel for sharks? Yeah. So for me, again, what I use is might be a little overkill and I guess I'll get some flack for that. Um, but for shark, I'm using an 8,000 size reel. Now I kind of downgraded to 6,000 size reels. Now that I've been doing it a couple of years and invested in a couple spinning reels that have like the live liner feature. I'm a pen guy. So I have two pen fear 6,000s live liners. And then also upgraded this year to have a pen 65,000, 6,500 size spin fisher live liner. And what that is, what's a live liner. So there's a little switch that you can do on the back of the reel. And what it does is it puts it in basically almost free spool. So that when, since I'm using a Carolina rig and it can go, I, I have them right here if I'm gonna show you, but. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be awesome. I know, like I'm, I'm a bass guy by, by yeah. trait. So this is really cool. So. Guys, this is awesome. Sorry. So this is probably my favorite reel. So spin fisher 65 it's got 50 pound braid and then i have like 50 pound mono top shot so it has a switch here like it's normal you can reel but once you have once you flip it it has like four different one two three and four but once you flip it it's essentially 
in, it can just take. Ah, okay. And then once you reel, it automatically, and it's back and ready to go. That's brilliant. So when I first started, I was just using my shark equipment, shark stuff. And you got to loosen the drag on the top. And then once you let it run, because I'm using a circle hook, then I have to tighten it, tighten it, tighten it. Hope that it's at the right drag and then reel. So there I, I can set my drag how I want it, cast it, flip the switch. Once that fish take it, takes it, it has minimal resistance. That is so smart. That is a really, really cool feature. Guys, like uh, that's really, if you really, where can people get that? If people listening here want, like, where do you go for them? Uh, I just ordered it online. I got, get it all from, it's a website called Tackle Direct. They're actually semi-local. They're from New Jersey. They price match. So Bass Pro had a sale um, on that spin fisher. I called, they price matched it. I bought line and they spooled it for me. So what type of, do you have a particular brand of braid that you really like? I use uh, Power Pro. Power Pro. Yeah, I know it's expensive, but I, it's never going to last forever, really. though. You know? Yes. Yeah. I mean, some of that braid's been on a couple of years on some of my sharks, though. Now, what, what type of shark do you really want to catch? Sand tigers. Sand, Sand tigers, tigers are my favorite. I would love to catch a bull, though. Dude, those things are just, those things are yeah. gnarly. Those things are me. <laughs> I want to I wanna say this before I miss it, because we're talking about my equipment for mm -hmm. uh, the flatheads. One switch that I've made that has been, helped me a lot is rod holders. The rod holders make a big difference to me. Um, you see guys, and again, they all work. I've caught them on them, but they have little, I don't even know if I have any, any right now down here. I have on. If you give me a minute, I'll find it. Yeah, go for it, dude. Absolutely. Right. This is, this is freaking awesome. So, um, I've learned so much. This is really cool. Okay, well, I'm, I'm a pro catfish guy here. I don't know about that. <laughs> You've caught more than I have. That's for dang sure. Oh, these, things, these things are cool. I don't, of course, I don't have the one that I don't really use anymore. But it's basically, you know, a, like a, like if you stick a, uh, like a stick into the, into the bank, like a Y stick, and you just lay it on top of that. Mm -hmm. So when the fish takes it, there's some friction between the line and that stick, right? So I just bought something simple like this, or you could use a PVC pipe. They're harder to carry, but if, this is small. It fits in my backpack. I have a seven foot six rod. Um, that way the rod can sit. And then when the fish takes it, all, it has free line to go pull off your reel and go through the guides on your rod. On a Y stick, when it's laying on top like that, the line has to rub on that Y stick. So I definitely have a, had, have a better hookup ratio when I use, when I switched to rod holders like that or PVC. So on the catfish front, let's kind of walk through the seasons. When you say the springtime, mm -hmm. what do catfish look for specifically to spawn? So uh, water temperature. Okay. So once, again, I might be off five, five plus or minus degrees. Once that water temperature hits the month of June in this area, end of May, early June, I believe 70 degrees, that's when they begin to spawn. They begin to get active when it's, 50 degrees you know they're coming out of winter not very active so they want to eat then they spawn month of june and then july you can start catching them again you can still catch them in the spawn but just not as frequently like i said before you think you haven't figured it out you go out you catch four or five of them next weekend nothing what you know what and we'll do this here let's do this real quick we're gonna pull up google earth and we're gonna go to let's say you know what guys we're gonna use the shenandoah river because they're not there that way we're not gonna burn any of his spots but we can kind of like walk through kind of a map breakdown of what to look for kind of on the potomac river mm -hmm. so we're gonna go to let's see to do where's ed's ferry where's lock there there it is there perfect all right so what we're dealing with right here is this is the Shenandoah River. Okay. We got we got we got we got little slack eddy right here. It's this is deep water right right there. Perfect. So it is it's March. Let's say it's March April, and you're trying to go out here, and you're gonna let's say you have access to all the bank just for okay. this thought exercise here. Okay. And this water I know right here is super deep right in this area. Okay. Are you targeting the deepest water possible in March? What are you looking for? 
Yeah, if I had access to get to known deep, deep water, I'm definitely going to those holes. Um, but from the bank, you're kind of limited. So what I like to do, any type of creek or tributary that dumps into the Potomac, that's where I would recommend. Okay. But again, flatheads are opportunist feeders. So I've I've picked, and this might just been been dumb luck. And this again, this is my second thing: fresh bait. One, two, time on the water. Just having fresh bait and just having it be in the water. And just putting that time in, that's going to increase your chances for a flathead. Uh, the, like I've mentioned the guy before, Spencer from River Certified, on one of his videos, I believe he said, and he's fishing in the Midwest, so it's totally different, I guess you could say. But one every eight hours is a good is good really? for a flathead. Yes. I went, I went fishing last weekend, and I did not catch any flathead. I caught three channels. It's like, it, even though I target them with the live bait, and always that's so crazy to me because yeah. the way i don't know it's just when you think of something that's such a ravenous eater um and i think i've guys i probably made this analogy in one other one other show but like they're like like almost like feral hogs is the way you have this thought of them that there's mm -hmm. a ton of them out there and they're just destroying the ecosystem but then i hear from you and it's like yeah but these guys are really hard to catch and it's such yeah. a weird interesting thing to be like how could something that that is so that people believe is so dangerous to the the ecosystem, and yet they're so hard to freaking catch. So, well, I I guess I don't want to say I'm maybe I'm lazy, and maybe it's almost no, a social, no, no, no. maybe it's almost a social thing when I go. I enjoy to go cast out, sit on the river. I'm sitting down. I'm relaxing. It's very peaceful to me. Mm -hmm. um, I was at Lander a couple weekends ago, um, and a guy at the boat ramp. Uh, on, I have, I, I'll talk about it, I guess, at the end of the show. Um, uh, he was fishing for smallmouth, very nice guy. Um, we, hit, we, we were talking because we were loading our kayaks at the same time. Um, and we both got back at the same time. I was targeting flatheads. I caught a channel. He caught three flatheads and he was smallmouth fishing. So it was just kind of funny. I, I guess, honestly, like the smallmouth camp is probably catching. Um, a lot more flatheads than they'd expect because they're just, they're predators. I think you had a previous guest and I don't, I don't know his name, but I really like when he goes on, when he talks about his fishing report and he talked about how the flathead are changing the smallmouth behavior. Oh yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so if, um, you're targeting smallmouth with typical behavior patterns, now that flatheads have been in here 10 years, mm. there can be to be some changes. And he yeah. was using, he was using, and I don't want, I'm going to get made fun of this because anytime I go smallmouth fishing, I'm, I'm throwing a quarter ounce uh, jig head with a chartreuse grub and that's it. Right. So that, that's all I'm doing. But he, he had the chartreuse grub tail and it looked like you're going to, you're going to know this better than me. Uh, it's like, it was, it looked like a spinner bait, but, yeah. it had the, but it had the chartreuse grub tail on the back. And he said he caught, he didn't have a weight, but he said he caught three flat had the biggest being 18 inches, foot and a half. Okay. And that's, what's so fascinating to yeah. me is I fish tournaments all over the place. And I know like it, the funniest thing was like, you know, if it's a good catfish fishery, cause you're going to catch about six of them when you're going bass fishing. Like <laughs> if I never catch a catfish bass fishing, I'm like, there's probably no catfish in here because mm -hmm. it's usually if there are blue cats or flatheads in there, you're going to hook one or two. Yep. Why is it you don't use lures when you catfish? Because if I throw a chatterbait, I'm going to find a blue cat on, a, up on the tidal Potomac river. Like that's right. easy. Like I'm going to snag yeah. one or two. Yeah. Like, why do you just sit in one spot? It seems so weird. Cause like, you're right. It's a predator. And maybe that's the reason yeah. bass fishermen catch them so much. If I had the access, like, especially during the daytime, if you don't catch a flathead in like 15, 20 minutes move. Mm. Right. But when I'm on the bank, it's you're lugging all your gear, you're casting yeah. out, you got your camp there. It, it is what it is. You're staying most of the time. But I guess as you, I forgot, I guess where you move, as you move, your chances of catching a flathead would increase, especially during the daytime. So I've never caught one during the day. I've caught one in early morning, but during the daytime on, on the kayak, I've tried, I've only caught in channels. And the analogy that I've heard people say on uh, different flathead uh, Facebook groups and, and YouTube and stuff is what they love their cover. They love their log jams, their logs. Like if you're fishing for them during the day and you cast out your bait, don't expect to get it back. Because hmm. you're throwing it into the structure because that's where they are. 
Interesting. Well, why is it they hunt at night, you think? <sighs> that, I don't know. But maybe it could be the light levels. They like the lower light. Because like, um, it's like a nocturnal predator, I guess, like a shark. But you can catch a shark during the day too, just like a catfish. I yeah, guess. that's what I was going to say. It's like, yeah. like sharks will, will bite, you know, regardless of night or day. And I know fly, yeah. or, uh, blue cats and channel cats are, are you can catch them at the daytime. But flyheads specifically, it seems like they're such a nighttime feeder. Yeah. And I think the, I think the not knowing, the unknown is what makes them that the appealing to a lot of people because mm. you don't know, like there's just lots to be known. Like I said, you think you haven't figured them out one weekend and then you get skunked the next and you're fishing the same spot. Have you ever used like a, have you ever gone drift fishing with your kayak? No, not yet. I I normally just anchor out again. I'm just getting used to it. Like I got a, a I got a 12 foot new canoe frontier so I can stand on it. Um, but I, I'm not, I've only been doing it. I, I've only been going out since April. So I'm not an expert by any means. So I'm, I'm just getting comfortable standing up on it and stuff like that. So uh, I, as I get better with it, yeah, uh, I feel like I'll try that. But I, I feel like the water is just so shallow that a lot of people, you know, you got other flathead, like you go to the Mississippi River, you can get on your nice catfish boat and just drift the whole channel. If you're fishing the upper Potomac, you know, it's three feet of water. So True, yeah. but you could go to Big Slack now that you have the, the kayak. You could go That's to some of these other places now. Yeah, I've never tried that. Now, I have tried, uh, and it was the guest that you have that does the fishing report, really like when he gets on here. He was talking about, I believe it was White's Ferry. He says mm -hmm. it's a little deeper there, and I, yes, I've gone there and found some six to eight foot holes that I've tried. And I've got, I got bites there, but I never landed anything. Interesting. So That's crazy. Yeah. So besides like the sh uh, upper Potomac, is there anywhere else that you like to catfish? Um, for flatheads? No, I plan on this winter and I just kind of dabbed into it. Blue cats down in the lower Potomac in the DC area. In now the winter time. Yes. I've, I've seen a lot of people catch 50, 70 pounders oh, there. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. The I'm sure too. Is it because like, is that where they winter or something like that? I, I that, I just think that's they're there and so plentiful. And I, mm. I think they, and don't quote me on this. I'm not a blue catfish expert, but I think in the summer that they're not as like active because the water temperature is so hot. So when that water temperature gets down a little more, that's when they get more active. So I plan on trying that. And there's spots there that are really nice because Haynes Point, you got the Washington Channel on one side, you got the Potomac on the other. The depth chart maps are available. You can see it online. You can find the spots and you can literally fish from your car. Mm -hmm. That's nice. You don't have to, you can bring your gear and you're not carrying it down the trail, down the CNO Canal, and then down a path to get to the river like you are up here. It's readily like that. Are, are your tactics the same for blues as, as flatheads? Uh, yes, but the bait, uh, if I could get my hands and again, I don't know if it's, I'm not an expert. If I could, you can get shad. Like if you catch shad, that's a little more oily and greasy and cut that. That's good. I've seen people use eel. I've seen people use chicken breasts. Um, the, what I, what I caught the 22 pounder on a couple of weeks ago with me and my friends, we caught it on cut bluegill because that's all we had. Mm. And I've also just so I went down there to have something different. I've caught a ten pound blue cat on mackerel that I bought from the store. Like, really? Yeah, you just yeah. So I, I guess it'd be because for blues I'm using cut. I'm not really using live. And you can also it's easy to catch a white perch there too. That's so crazy to think though that the flathead really is a a predator that wants movement. Um, yeah compared to any other catfish species. It's just it's so crazy. Like it has, mm -hmm. even a shark, like you said, like you think of the alpha predator of the ocean, yeah. it'll still eat stuff off the bottom, but a flathead wants something moving. Yes. Yeah. And that's why I love the, the free, the live liner reels that, uh, and the Carolina rigs or Sandy Cooper rigs that allow when it takes it to let it go and not feel any resistance. Cause believe it or not, a lot of those hits are, are, they can be pretty finicky when they bite. Really? Like when my, when I caught that blue, blue, that thing took off like a freight train. Right. And you let it go. Like when I, when I get a hit and I'm targeting flatheads, I'm letting it take it for, 
I'd say maybe 10 to 30, 15 to 30 seconds. Cause I wanted to, to get it in its mouth and, and swim off. Um, I, I don't know the science behind that, but once, once I began doing that, my hookup ratio has gotten better. Now you're using circle hooks. Could you tell the audience like how, when you, when you set the hook and stuff, like is a circle hooks hook set different than like a regular hook hook set? Yeah. Yeah, so the circle hook is designed to catch it in the corner of the mouth, catch the fish in the corner of the mouth. So you're actually like if you're using a J hook, once that fish bites, you're setting it. But when you're using a circle hook, I'm letting it go. And as it runs, I'm literally just reeling down, right? And having it feel tight. And in theory, it catches it right in the corner of the mouth. And I honestly, in these last two years, I don't think I've had a fish that's been gut hooked. That's insane. That's really, really cool. Corner. Yep. Um, okay. And then, and then back to our, I know I'm a little HGHD, so it kind of, no, you're good. Things, but good. A- after the spring bite, they spawn and then we get into the summertime. Now, are they going to be in those deep holes all the time, or are they going to be in more shallow water once the summertime comes? Uh, again, at summer I'm fishing at night. It's okay if they're, they're, they're feeding. So as long as you have good bait, you're on the water, you got a chance. So I would say during the day, you would want to find those holes enough night. And, and if you can find them, you can, I'm sure if you, if you found someone who fishes those catfish tournaments, has a nice boat with the racks on the back and they're fishing between dam four and dam five, they know all the deep water holes. And that's what I would prefer if I could find them and had access to it. But if I'm from the bank, you just want to have that time on the water. Gotcha. 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 Yeah. And then, so then we go from the summertime. It's really where you want live, but you want good bait. You want good yes. fresh bait. That's yeah. really important. Mm-hmm. Wherever you can get access to the water, yeah. that's the yeah. best place. Deep water. Mm-hmm. If it's there, great. Yep. We're going into the fall. Is it the same thing or is the fall a little bit different? Again, I, since this is my first year not coaching, I get to try the fall out this year. So what my, my plan is I'm going to do what I normally do. If I can find a Creek that dumps into the, river right you got access to bait fish sometimes they'll go up the creek looking for food i'm doing the same thing um and i think what's big is also the the water temperature and water levels right those temperatures you know when i was out it was 82 degrees now as they fall and it gets close to those springtime temperatures that feeding should occur again so i'm hoping i have some fall nights where i'm catching four to five a night That's freaking insane. Like we, we, and you, you mentioned earlier, like you might catch, if you catch one, I think I, 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 I don't misquote. Yeah. Every eight hours. Yeah. Do you ever catch doubles and triples or anything like that? Do you ever catch multiple? And if you do, is it like you catch one and then you do have a huge spell that you're waiting or is it just a boom, boom. And then a break. Yeah. So, uh, it was actually one night in July. I think I fished for maybe five to six hours total. And I caught all three flatheads within like an hour of each other. Wow. So like that's, I would, they, I, from my experience, it kind of comes in waves. Um, I know a couple of times that I've been up Williamsport area. I'm there. I start fishing at six, 7 PM. I'm there to pat. I had, it's been six hours. I haven't gotten a single bite. And then once it hit randomly 1145 midnight, I catch four in 45 minutes. So that's why I just say time on the water. That's insane. So, That's yeah. freaking insane. So I would say it comes in waves. So it's just getting a good bait in the water and just, just putting the time in. Talk about again, just for the people that, that, that are listening. If if somebody wanted to get into catfishing, what would you recommend is the best setup? Um, and let's go like cheap and then let's go like the best. Okay. So I would, I, I, I really feel you could just get any type of combo. You don't re- necessarily need a, um, a live line or reel or anything like that. You could probably just go to Walmart or Dick Sporting Goods and just get maybe a, a seven, six foot rod, something that can throw maybe an ounce or two. Cause that's all you need to get on the bottom ounce to two. And um, you could probably just fill it with mono and just, just cast out and try it. That's, that's what I would say. Now, if you really wanted to get into it, I'm a pen guy. So let's go pristine setup. Let's go full Santa Claus wish list setup. What would you, what would you do? I'm, Again, I'm a, again, some, I would get flack for this cause I'm a spinning guy, right? A lot of catfish use conventional reels and they make fun of people who use spinning gear, but I, I don't understand that. I know. You know what I mean? So I'm probably what I have right here. I'm, I'm have a 6,000 size, 6,500 size, uh, 
Penn Spinfisher, that's one of their Penn's really good models, but they're, that's pretty expensive. You're looking for two, like two, three hundred, two in between two and three hundred dollars just for the real. But the, uh, if you want to get something really good quality, but don't have to break the bank necessarily under a hun- around a hundred dollars, but you're gonna get something that's gonna last you years. I would go with the Penn Fierce, uh, Penn Fierce. six thousand live live liner. That's that was my beginner shark reel. That's a, I have mostly them. I do have a battle and I have a spin fisher. I was going to say what's nice about that guys that uh, for everyone that's listening at home, if you do pit pu- like pump the money out and get the higher quality stuff, it can double as saltwater. It can double yep. as surf fishing, which is kind of mm-hmm. nice versus if you go to Walmart, I mean, no offense, but that probably is not going to handle if you catch a bull red or a shark from the beach. Right. Whereas if you go with that. Um, and the one thing we might have, we touched on this already, but I, I forgot what rod are you throwing when you, when you're doing this shark fishing and stuff, is it a specific type of rod that you need for surf fishing and, and so catfishing for the surf fishing? Ideally, like if, if I, when I was, I'm throwing like a 12 foot spinning rod, oh this, my, God. My, my biggest rod is a 12 foot, uh, Tika dolphin surf rod. I think it can throw up to like, damn, I could, I could look, but I think it's like 12 ounces or 10 ounces or something. Dude, like that, that thing is massive. Yeah. So, yeah it could, uh, doesn't say it on here, but, uh, four to 10 ounces. So good Lord. So that's what I'm using for sharks. Um, but kind of in the middle, which I use for both. Cause I'm from the, if I'm from the bank and you really want to get distance, I'm using, I, I'm using a 10 foot rod. Um, cause you're getting the good distance, but you're not dealing with the length of lugging around a 12 foot rod. Like that's, and those break down, right? It's yeah, yeah, yeah. One piece. yeah. That'd be a yeah, nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm using a 10 foot rod, but when I'm fishing from the kayak, I'm not using that 10 foot rod. I'm mm-hmm. using a seven and a half foot and the brand is called Whisker Seeker. They're a big catfish brand. A lot of my hooks and terminal tackle are all Whisker Seeker. Hmm. And then guys, I'll link, I'll put a link into the episode yeah. description for, for Whisker Seekers too. Yeah. If you guys want to go shopping for that. Um, let's see one question. Definitely. It's probably going to come up. If you don't have a clicker system on your reel, do you have any like MacGyver way to be able to have that free lining ability without having it? Yeah. So what you want to do, and I got the reel right here is you want it to be able to sit in its place, but just change the drag. Right. And you want it. I see that's not, you want it enough so that it sits and doesn't move and stays in the current, but loose enough so that if the fish takes it, it's not feeling too much resistance. Gotcha. So So that when you get the bite and this is, if you have, you're picking it up, you're twisting it. And then you're reeling it. I've seen people actually when they got a bite, and I actually did this for a five foot spinner. I, tr- I tried it because I was only three for five that day. Um, I actually flipped it in free spool, tighten the drag. Smart. That's so smart. Okay. And, and then flip the bail. So if you don't have it, and again, I only got these these live on a reels just this year. And I've been doing it for two years without them and, and caught my BPB not on a live on a reel. So you don't necessarily need it. It's just, it's nice to have, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to say, dude, you got to spend your money on something besides your family. Like, right. right. Yeah. You, you're going to, you're you got to get some yeah. toys. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we covered bait. We covered the hook, uh, which this is really fascinating stuff. The bite and the take on a flathead. Um, when you hammer into them, what do you expect on that? Are they, are they going to jump? Are they going to run hard? Like, what do they do? Head shakes. They're known for their head shakes. So your tip of the rod, when they when they get that fish and they get their their head shaking left and right, and that's what they're that's what they're known for. And they're gonna fight, they're gonna pull drag. Um honestly, when I when I when I when I caught that 22, I'm going back to the blue catfish, mm-hmm. where they fight, it just felt heavy. Hmm. You know what I mean? I mean it was nice. It pulled a little bit, it ran like a freight train, but the flathead actively fighting. I think that's why it has such a following, a cult following, really. Because you're getting those that fight, and that's what got me into it. I wanted the pull. It's like I'm shark fishing, dude. I mean, it's it's so crazy you mentioned that. Um, every time we catch blue cats or channels, you automatically know it's a catfish. Generally speaking, because of how it fights. It, yes, it, we call it like it rolls. It just rolls around and yes. wallows. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the couple of flathead I've caught, um, and the, it wasn't guys. It wasn't on the Upper Potomac. It was when I was fishing out of state they pull like they will smoke a bait and they yeah. will, they will run you hard. Yeah, absolutely. And 
that's how that's why I got into it. What um what I mean, what are some bucket list items for you? I want to catch over a 30 pounder. But I want to catch over a 30 pounder in the Frederick Montgomery County area. And the state record you think is around 50, 30, 50? 50, 53. The biggest that I saw this year in tournament in the Williamsport area is 35. 35? Yeah. So if you catch a 40, that'd probably be the biggest on the river. I would say so. That'd be freaking that'd be freaking awesome. But it's it's funny because the flathead fishermen don't talk. So like there might be if if a, if there someone might as well last someone might have last week caught a 45, 50 pounder. He might not even post it. You know it's what so I mean? Just so it's not known because when people see it, oh, I gotta get out there and try and get it, try and catch it. Yeah, it's so weird that the the flathead community and the musky community are so hush hush about everything. Yes. Yep. But the musky community doesn't fight the smallmouth. The, let me rephrase this: the the smallmouth, the the bass community, and the, and the musky community do not have this same friction as the as the flathead and, and the bass community. Do, um, do you, I was going to ask you a question about that. Do you think that's because flatheads impact that smallmouth behavior more, or they eat smallmouth more than smallmouth more than musky do? Was it because the smallmouth fish are now seeing more flathead because? You know, they're, they're targeting a smallmouth and they're catching more flatheads now than they have in years past. I think, so we know, like, there's enough data with the blue cats on, on, in the salt water right now that they are a fantastic eating machine mm -hmm. and they are everywhere. Yep. And so it's very easy to cast blame on them, whether it's justified or not for what they do, because there's so mm -hmm. many of them. A musky by its nature, you're never going to have a lot of them in the ecosystem right. because it's just like one big dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot harder to, to blame that for any issues you see. And mm -hmm. you rarely have images. And I think it's all optics. You never have an image usually of a, of a musky wallowing on the surface with a small moth down its throat. Mm -hmm. But we have those images of that of a yeah. flathead. And then it becomes a poster right. child of evil. Yep. Um, I think that's part of it. And, and the other thing is too, like m m catfish and bass so much of the time will inhabit the same waterways. Yep. Whereas pike musky, they, you will not, when I've gone up North, you rarely will catch them together. They station okay. differently because mm -hmm. smallmouth know to fear them. And maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's what it is, is the bass don't fear them as much possibly. Mm -hmm. But at least when I went up North, like if you, if you hooked a muskie or a pike, you just leave the area because there's usually not a lot of bass around because they know to stay clear. Um, and I, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but yeah. it, there are more flathead than muskie. Generally, I would think that's safe to say yeah, yeah, yeah. in an area. Um, and you're going to catch them more. And I think that's the thing too, is I've caught more catfish bass fishing than I have musky or like, like when I'm musky, yeah. I've caught one musky bass fishing in my life period. And it was a freak mm -hmm. accident. I've yep. caught a thousand different types of catfish. And so yep. I think there's the optics there that, okay, because I'm catching it and I'm not targeting it. Therefore a guy that is targeting this thing must be catching like a million times more than me. Right. But I, I don't know. It, it's, and then you have, I think once you have people posting, and I saw, I, I got to find the thread of like a guy saying he's going to use bass as bait. And then that's a great way to piss off one of the communities. And then somebody yeah. else posted like, I'm just going to gut them and throw them on the bank. And all of a sudden you got civil yeah. war. <laughs> yeah. I, I did respond to one of your comments on that, on that video uh, uh, from a, it was like, I believe it was two or three months ago. And someone said every flathead I get. And I was like, yeah, but I, again, I'm hope, I I want I'm look forward to hear the episode. I, I believe you said it's dropping Tuesday with the DNR, and he talks about the flathead. See if there's any positive or negative effects or impacts that they're having on the Upper Potomac. So I, I I'm open to learn about that. I would like yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is, honestly, like talking to John and um and talking to Odin Kirk and everybody that I've I've been blessed to have on the show. What are you going to do? Like, like, that's the thing too, is like, whether you, your former or against them, they're here. Yeah. You, that's, well, you, you talked about, and again, someone smarter than me, they can figure out how to do it. You talked about how the snakehead, they're here now, I guess legally to make some money on it. They're eventually, like you said, 10 years from now, there might be limits and stuff on it. What if they did something like that for flatheads? Like oh yeah. If they're, if they're here from now, uh, again, you're, I, 
if you if you catch and again it's a whole other ball game. You catch and target trout, you keep it. You got to pay extra money for a trout stamp, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe if and I would pay if you want to target flathead, you want to be a flathead fisherman. I don't know how many people will be honest about it though. You you pay a little extra money because you're targeting flathead or some or something along the line. Now I might get flat from the flathead community for saying that, but just so that there's a happy medium. Something along the lines of that, and like I said, someone smarter than smarter than me can make that make that decision or come up with a way so that there's a happy medium and both parties can be happy and a positive effect on both flatheads if they're here to stay. That is, and smallmouth. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a question of like, oh, are they here to stay? Because it's like, you, what are you going to do? You're going to poison yeah. the whole river. And the same thing mm-hmm. when people talk about the snakehead or the blue catfish. It, it right. they're here. How do we? stem the tide and make sure this place can, it can hit equilibrium. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I honestly think in, in my heart, and this is something I, I kind of, I didn't bring up to John and I, I really want to maybe the next time I have him on, you're not allowed to introduce a new species because it's, you're afraid it'll take over the river. Correct. But then on the same aspect, why can't we stock bluegill and minnows and bait yeah. to see if it'll help. And a lot of times the answer from, from the DNR will be like, well, you can't stock enough to make a difference. It's like, well, then how is it someone can illegally stock enough to make a difference, but we can't legally stock stuff to make it, to make a difference on the other side of it. Because yeah. the thing that I'm seeing in the rivers from everyone I've talked to is you have so many predators chasing so little bait. Big fish. I, was, I think like, I don't mean to cut you off. No, go for it. Like, I guess you'd have to, because one predator can eat exponentially amount of bay fish. So I think just to match the amount of predators, you have to exponentially add the amount of bay fish that you're stocking too. So maybe they'd have to figure out some type of way, how much, how many blue girl are we going to put into the river? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I agree with that. Like, but then let's have a conversation because it, yeah. it's cheaper. You could buy a, a half a million minnows for mm-hmm. a tenth of the cost of trying to stock smallmouth bass mm-hmm. or, or musky. You could do the same thing with bluegill. They're very easy to keep. And mm-hmm. so even if it's just sections of the river, like, and that's what I'm thinking too. It's like, if you think Williamsport, if people assume, let's just say that Williamsport is the hardest hit, then let's just fix the Williamsport area. Let, mm-hmm. Let's just start introducing more bait there to balance it out. Because I, I don't know, I'm just spitballing, but there's gotta be stuff we could do to yeah. help it get to that equilibrium. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause even Odenkirk said like, with the with the calling of the snakeheads and stuff, it's starting to balance out in the Potomac. Okay. And the Rappahannock looks like the Potomac did 10 years ago, where the snakehead is now just catching hold and their populations are exploding. Okay. So he even says, like, the river's going to find a balance with, with the flathead or with, with, with the snakeheads. Mm-hmm. So if that's the hope with the catfish, what can we do to help it between now and it finding that equilibrium point? Like right. what, what can we do to help balance it out? Cause I, I really, you know, as a, as a paying customer to fish all these waters, mm-hmm. if you told me like, Hey, we're going to stock some bait in here to kind of like help out all, all species, all predators. Yeah. I'd be for it. Great. I'll do a stamp. Yeah, too. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause the Mississippi river has everything. The Mississippi river yeah. has flathead blues, muskies and smallmouth, mm-hmm. And yet all of them survive there without a problem. So right. why is it here? Right. I think yeah, I don't only know. time's gonna only time's gonna tell. I feel I, like I, like you said. I think nature is gonna find its equilibrium, and it's eventually gonna even out. Now there might be times where there's a bunch of just talking about flatheads. I'm kind of rambling right now. Yeah, could be, there could be like you said, the next couple of years before it goes to equilibrium. That's when you could possibly catch the biggest one, or it could be a case that there's not a lot of bait fish. The flathead ha- flatheads have no predators, and then you got a majority of smaller size flatheads. So I guess we'll only find out only time's going to tell when nature finds that equilibrium. What eats a flathead? Is it just other flatheads? I'd say so. Yeah. Well, uh, this, this is one bait. It's not a flathead bullheads. Mm. Supposedly bullheads. And I've never gotten a chance to catch one again. I'm, I'm where I'm catching my bait. I'm, I'm fishing in creeks that dump out in the Potomac. I don't even catch my bait in a pond. Hmm. Right. I catch my bait in creeks that dump out into, into the Potomac and I've never caught in a bullhead yet, but supposedly bullheads are really good for flatheads too. And they're super hardy. So you cast a flathead out, it's going to stay alive and be lively for hours. Gotcha. Very hardy. That makes yeah. so much sense. So, and they love them. I would love to get my hands on them. 
Interesting. I didn't even know that. Yeah. No, I mean, so, I mean, Pat, we, we've covered so many things. Like yep. what else about the the controversy you think we should bring up or talk about, or is there anything else or have we touched on it all that, that you feel like you see when you're out on the water from your perspective as a passionate flathead angler? Mm-hmm. I, in my experience, any small, small mouth fisherman that I've came across has been nothing but very nice and cordial. We wish each other luck. So I've never experienced anything negative. The only thing that I've ever seen negative is just online. Really? <laughs> online? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and, and when I'm going, when I'm going at night, I, I really don't see smallmouth fishermen or any other bass fishermen. So if I had to say something, I, I would I would love one to find, again, I look forward to hearing your episode with the DNR speaking more data on it. And mm-hmm. again, hopefully we can find a happy medium and, and all get along. You know what I mean? Like, I, I want the smallmouth fishermen to catch their PB and I hope they would want me to do the same thing. No, I agree. And mm-hmm. I think, I really think there's a way that we could all come together on this thing, right. especially if we think of it from the way of we're all trying to make sure the river can actually produce citations and trophies for all species, whether it is a flathead, whether it's a smallmouth. And is there a way we could actually come together on this and figure it right. out? Like, yep. what do we have to do to help this fishery? They're here. So then how do we make it good for everybody? And there's walleye too. I mean, hell, we didn't, yeah. we touched a, a, a walleye a little bit with the DNR because they actually, they introduced them, but like, there's a ton of predators in this place. How yeah. do we make sure that like, all of them and crappy and co- and crappy? Yeah. Yeah. Which, I didn't, yeah. which I didn't know until you you had your guests on who does the reports. I had no idea that they're in the river. I didn't know that. I didn't know, yeah. I didn't know there was a um, freaking crappie in the canal system at Williamsport. I caught a, really? yeah, I don't even know if I took a picture of it. I was there with my wife, but I caught a, it's like a six, seven inch crappie. Wow. Right there where you drive down to the boat ramp. Supposedly, I don't know if it's legal, but I've seen people online in other States use crappie as bait as well. I think it's, I think it's probably legal. I, I know like the things that aren't legal are like American eels. You can't use in certain places because they're protected. And then you can't use crap. What was the other thing? Goldfish is a big one. Yep. Or, and also or cer- certain types of shad you can't use. So I really? don't think about shad for blues. Uh, I believe some of that's protected, but the, huh. I believe that might be in DC waters, but I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure certain types of shad are protected. Did you ever want to go to like, I don't know, like Sandy Cooper or some of these like, like legendary places and, and kayak catfish? Hell yeah. <laughs> now I'd rather be, I'd rather be on a, like a nice sea arc boat and yeah have a rod rack and sit in a seat and, and all that. But for, for being in this area and, and I can get to the river in 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes and have catch a flathead. I, I love it. I know Dude, you that's... talked about this, uh, like speaking of like, citations and things like that for flatheads technically my 25 pound 30 pound flathead would be a citation flathead i think it has to be over 25 but you got to kill it mm. so i'm not i i'm always i'm always cpr so yeah that, that's what's so yeah. crazy is like and this is something i don't like and again you know i, I wish maryland virginia did this texas does it where if you catch a, a citation of anything mm-hmm. you call them they'll keep it alive and then they'll give you a mount and they'll use it for breeding stock. So okay. they'll take it so that they can use the genes and they're harvesting things. So they put them in a pond so it can just basically just yeah. keep, keep making babies, but then they'll, they'll make you and they'll pay for it to make a replica mount. I, I honestly love that idea. I would, that I would, would be insane. Yeah. That that's a great idea. I've never thought of that. And that's why Texas like pumps out so many big ones. Cause if you catch a 10 pound bass, you call them, they'll pick it up, put it in their brood stock to make more 10 pound bass. And then they'll make you a mount of the same fish. It's like, mm-hmm. why doesn't anywhere else do this? But them like, that's how you, if you want 10 pound, if you want 10 point bucks out mm-hmm. in your field, you yeah. got to protect the gene pool. And I think it's yeah. the same thing that you got to do with all species. Honestly, that, that's a great idea. I'm, I'm all for it. If it makes it, you know, better for, so that gene pool, there's bigger fish in the water. This isn't that what we're all trying to catch. <laughs> I, I think so too. Yeah. I really does. Um, so yeah. Uh, closing thoughts, anything else on your mind? Any thoughts? Um, this is kind of off topic, but, um, the guy who I talked to at Lander boat ramp, he left, he had a white Toyota Tundra and he had a red old town canoe. He left his trolling motor at the boat ramp. Okay. He was gone. So I had, I had, to make a decision, either I could leave it there or I could take it. And there's a couple of Facebook groups. I weren't, it was Lander. So everything Frederick that has 50, 60,000 members, 
and there's a Potomac Monocacy fishing group. I posted in both of those. I took it. I posted in both of those that I have the Troy. I already have a Troy motor and he has his electrically crimped and tied down to fit his battery. So I want to get it back to him and do the honest thing. So I, if any of your listeners see him or know white Toyota Tundra, red old town lost a, uh, 55 pound Minn Kota trolling motor, uh, please. I would love to return it to its rightful owner. There you have it guys. Yeah. So <laughs> if you are that person, yeah. this is your lucky day for listening to this podcast yeah. at this time. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Pat, I mean, th- thank you so much. It was so hard. I was digging around the communities for so long, trying mm-hmm. to find somebody in the catfish community to come on and talk about it. And I got no one. And really, really no, no one wanted to talk at all. It, it was really hard to find. I reached out on social media. I don't know if you saw some of those posts, like the Maryland fishing thing, like, Hey guys, I want somebody to come on and talk about it. Um, okay. cat, cat daddy, who's a catfishing guide. Uh, mm-hmm. I haven't heard back from him yet. Um, okay. I think his name is Gene. Uh, okay. but, yeah, it was just, it's hard to get people that yeah. want to come just talk about what's going on here. And what I keep telling everybody, it's like the DNR listens to this show now. And I know that yeah. because they reached out to me after listening about, and they saw the com- that comment thread was the hottest thing ever because yeah. you and the DNR and everyone else reached out to me about like, oh yeah, yeah we need to get on and talk about this. Yeah. So if people want to voice their opinion about the river, people are going to hear it. And, yes. and that's a good thing, not a bad thing, because we mm-hmm. need the right people to hear it so we can actually make changes and fix things. Right. That, and that, that, that whole thing of one side, one side, uh, cordially speaking about cordially. each other's opinions, get the data, and then come together to make a decision on what's best for both parties or both, both camps. Amen, sir. Amen. Yep. Pat, do you have anything you want to plug? Any sponsors, social media, anything like that? I don't have any sponsors or anything, but anyone who wants to get into catfishing or flathead um, in general, there's a couple of YouTube channels that, I, that I've that i learned a lot about. Um, again, Spencer River Certified would be one. Uh, Chris Souders, he's like a torment cat fisherman. He's really good. I learned how to snell on some of his YouTube videos. Um, Steve Douglas, he's the owner of monster rod holders. Um, that's like the best rod holder you can get for catfishing. I get a lot of boats are rigged up with those, his videos, um, those three really. Pat, you have been yeah. awesome. Thank you so much. It yep. seems like you've done this your whole life. You're a fantastic <laughs> guest to have on the show. Uh, you, t- you did a great job guys. Again, please like and subscribe to the channel. Please give this video a like. I want to get this over 22 uh, likes would be fantastic. And again, if you'd like to be on the show, please reach out to me. Reach out to me on Instagram, or you can reach out to me at fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Again, we're the fastest growing uh, outdoor fishing show in the greater DC metropolitan area. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.